That should be better. We like that? Wake up. Yeah, that's good. Extra coffee day. That's what they call this day. Yeah, so today we're, we're in the second part of our series that we're calling Greater. And, and one of the things that I think is important to understand about this series is uh, when thinking about how God feels about us, I, I think it's important to understand that God thinks you're pretty great. He really does. Just as you are right here, right now, no matter what's going on in your life, God thinks you're pretty great. And whatever your relationship with him, whatever, wherever you're at in that journey, he also thinks that's pretty great too. But here's the thing. God doesn't want our lives to just be pretty great. He wants them to be greater. And part of what that means is that we're drawing closer to him, that we're growing in our relationship with him, that we're learning how to be more like him. And it's my hope that in this series that we're going to find ourselves digging just a little bit deeper, drawing just a little bit closer and discovering a little bit more about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. So in this series, we're taking a much deeper look at this passage here. What it means to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength. Last week, we talked a little bit about what it is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart by cultivating a heart for God, right? And we do that by examining our hearts and and allowing God to do the same thing or inviting Him to do the same in us by removing what doesn't belong through confession and repentance, by focusing on our heart for God and the, the things of God and His kingdom, And above all else, by guarding our heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Today we're going to continue in this series uh, talking about loving God with all of our soul. Now in order to get where we're going this morning, uh, it's important to understand that there is actually a difference between spirit and soul. And it's one that I guess most people don't often think about it. In fact, myself included. And I think sometimes we take for granted that they're kind of one and the same. And that's not necessarily true. And in fact, when I started doing my own research, I actually wound up going to another pastor because he had it written out so well. And I want to share with you what it was that he said because I think it made it clearer than anything I wrote. In fact, when I reread what I wrote, uh, I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> you ever experienced that? Like I wrote it down, I'm like, oh, this is good, this is good. And I reread it and went, I don't even understand what that means. <laughs> All right. So um, this is actually born, this little piece here, I'm borrowing from another pastor. Um, And this is what he says about it, and I I like this, so stick with me, okay, for, for just a moment. First, the word spirit refers only to the immaterial part of a person, right? Human beings have a spirit, but we are not spirits. No, clearly, right? We got bodies. Um, Having said that, in Scripture, only believers are said to be spiritually alive, while unbelievers are said to be spiritually dead. The Spirit is that element inside of us which gives us the ability to have an intimate relationship with God. And whenever the word Spirit is used, it refers solely to the immaterial part of humanity that connects with God, who himself is Spirit. Now, the word soul, on the other hand, is a little different. It can refer to both the immaterial and the material aspects of a person. Now, hear this. This is where the distinction for me became much clearer. So human beings have a spirit. Human beings are a soul. In its most basic sense, the word soul means life. However, the Bible speaks of the soul in many different contexts. One of these is humanity's eagerness to sin. Because of the fall, humanity is naturally inclined to evil and our souls are tainted as a result. Another is, the soul, is that the soul is removed at the time of physical death. Another still is that the soul, as with the spirit, is the center of many spiritual and emotional experiences. The point is, whenever the word soul is used, it, can refer, it usually refers to the whole person, whether living and breathing now or in the afterlife. The soul and the spirit are connected. 
but they can also be separated. We see in Hebrews 4 and 12, for example, for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The spirit is the aspect of humanity that connects with God. The soul is the essence of the person. It is who we are. So in a very real way, what we're talking about when we talk about loving God with all of our soul is that place where our heart's passion becomes life action. All right? Clear as mud? (laughs) Awesome. Let's just leave it there and we'll move on, okay? So where we talked last week about how loving God with all of our hearts was about Him being our treasure, Him being the the object of our deepest affections above absolutely all of the things in this universe, loving Him with all of our soul adds to that the activity of our lives that comes directly out of a heart that is completely devoted to Him. So in a way, loving God with all of our soul is loving God with all of our heart and the response that occurs in and through us when he has all of our heart. They go together, don't they? Does God have all of your heart? I read a story once. I don't know if this is true. This could be just legend. People tell stories all the time, but I really like this one. I want to share it with you this morning. It said, In the middle of Abraham Lincoln's presidency, an elderly lady came and made an appointment to see him. As she entered his office, he inquired, How may I be of service to you, madam? The lady answered, Mr. President, I know you are a very busy man, and I have not come to ask you for anything. I simply came to bring you this box of cookies. There was a long silence, and tears flowed from Lincoln's eyes as he said, Madam, I am greatly moved by what you have done. For since I have become president, people have come into this office one after another, asking for favors and demanding things from me. You are the first person who has ever entered these premises, asking no favor but bringing a gift. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. In the way we live our lives, we need to learn to deliberately set a time, set apart time to come into God's presence. Not asking favors, not demanding things, just to be with Him, bringing the gift of a grateful heart, demonstrating to God that our hearts belong to Him. I mean, we often talk about how much God loves us. You know, for, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But sometimes we fail to think of how we feel towards God. Sometimes we fail to focus in our relationship on what we feel towards Him in His direction. I mean, sometimes we go to church, we give offerings, we do all kinds of good works, work for the kingdom of God, but often it's done out of a sense of this is what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. It's a heartbreaking reality that so many people out there don't take the time to tell God how much they love Him or spend time with Him telling Him why they love Him. I mean, most people do their duty knowing that God loves us, but for a lot of believers, the idea of emotionally loving God somehow is is difficult to wrap their minds and their hearts around. But it didn't used to be that way. If you look through the Scripture, Psalm 42 and 1 tells us, As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you. Psalm 84 and 2 declares, My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Psalm 143 and 6 says, I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Isaiah 26, 9, at least in the beginning of that verse, it says, My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. All of these scriptures were written about and come from a very deep place in the heart that is an all-consuming passion for God. 
It's a desire for God that goes very, very deep. So deep that sometimes it literally hurts. If you read through the Psalms, you're going to often see uh, aching going on. As David writes, this this heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, Lord, I just want to be close to you. It's clear that these writers' hearts were totally and completely His. Jesus says we need to love the Lord our God with all of our soul. Pardon? No, I'm good. We're in the right place. (laughs) Jesus says we need to love the Lord our God with all of our soul. This is the idea of total commitment. Whole commitment. It's an all-in kind of love. It's passion in action remember we said that the soul is the essence of the person that it is essentially who we are when a person is loving god with all their soul they become consumed with the idea of committing their time and their talents and their treasures to god their heart leads the body to live what it's experiencing in god david king david i mean Not announcement guy, David. King David. Although he's a king too, right? Yeah, brother. King David was a man after God's own heart. God's own word tells us this. And I've preached this before, and I'm sure you can remember that in Samuel 24 and 24, we're told about an Israelite that offers to supply David with all the wood and the animals and stuff that he needs to make a sacrifice. And David refuses. He responds and he says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David loved God so much that he was committed to giving something to God that actually cost him something. Do we have that kind of commitment for God? We find ourselves looking for ways to express our love for Him more than the expression we have right now. Martin Luther once said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Loving God with all of my soul is a love that leads me to give because I love Him. Not because of duty, not because of obligation, but because of the passion in my heart for Him. This is the kind of love that is so overwhelming that, I, that I, I'm consumed by God. I don't have to try and view the world through God's lens or His perspective because I can't stop myself from seeing things His way. I can't help but give my time to Him. I can't help but draw closer to Him to know Him better. It's almost beyond my control because I desire so much to be near. I can't help but give my gratitude to Him or give my praise to Him. I can't help but dedicate my resources to Him because He means more to me than everything. That's the passion and action that is loving God with all of our soul. Loving God with all of our soul should affect how we worship and live for Him here on Sunday, absolutely, but also how we live and worship Him on Monday through Saturday, too. There's a lot of reasons why we should love God with all of our soul. I mean, tons, but let me remind you of just a few. One of them is because of how much He has blessed us. Do you ever just, I mean, apart from Thanksgiving Sunday, do you ever stop in the midst of your day, and think of how richly God has blessed you. This is not a judgment. This is a a question I'm actually asking. What is it that you're grateful for? What is it that God has blessed you with? Let me hear something. Food. Amen? Right? Pastor didn't get this heavy because he's on a diet, let me say. Sandy. Pardon? Health. Oh. Anybody go outside today? It's chilly, right? How about heat? Huh? How about that that nice little cozy bed that you slept in last night? Right? Love. Love. Oh, my goodness. Love's one of my favorites. Water. You both hit the same one. That's awesome. Water. That's the one I always go to because I think sometimes in, in the nation that we live in, hallelujah, praise Jesus for Canada, we live in a nation where, where almost all of us can just walk to our kitchen, grab a glass out of the cupboard, pour it 
filled with crisp, cool, clean water to drink. Amen? God's Word. We could do this all day, truthfully. We really could, because God has blessed us richly. We are more blessed and have been blessed richly by God than most nations on the planet. We are incredibly blessed. Spoiled a little bit too, I would say. James 1 and 17 says that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. It's all Him. So as hard as life can be sometimes, and life can be hard sometimes, but as hard as life can be sometimes, the blessings of God are evident if we just stop and look. If we take the time to just notice Remember Jeremiah 29 and 11. This is like everybody's favorite verse, isn't it? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The Lord blesses us so richly because He loves us so richly. Another reason why we should love God with all of our soul is because He brings meaning and purpose to our lives. Now, I'm hitting some. You're probably going, yeah, I know this, okay? But that's good. It's good to be reminded, isn't it? He brings meaning and purpose to our lives. I remember, um, this is a long time ago now, but I remember way back when uh, Barbara Walters did an interview with Angelina Jolie, the actor. And in the interview, Barbara was asking her some tough questions, and she started asking her about some of these self-destructive things that Angela had done in her life and, and was asking her about why she had done them. And Angela answered, I don't know, except that I didn't have a sense of purpose. I felt so off balance all the time. I remember one of the most upsetting times of my life was after I had maintained success, financial stability, and I was in love. And I thought, I have everything that they say you should have to be happy, and I'm not happy. And after this interview, shortly after this interview, she adopted a child and she started pouring herself into humanitarian effort, and I wish I could say that fixed it. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that our true meaning and our true purpose in this life can only be discovered in the arms of our Creator. He brings meaning and purpose to our lives in a way that only He can. Not that you can't find some purpose in other things, but He brings meaning and purpose to our lives that we can only find in Him. And He has an incredible life planned out for each one of us if we will come to Him apologize for the, the ways we have hurt him in this life and let him know that we want to know him and we're going to trust him and the direction of our lives to him. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Another great reason why we should love God with all of our souls is because his love for us is so extreme. How extreme? It's pretty extreme, right? He gave his life for us. I mean, this is really actually what this Lenten season, this season of Lent, that's what this is about. It's the reminder of what he has sacrificed for us. And it is really, truly a great mystery, but it kind of boils down to this. Humanity rebelled against God, and as a result, we set ourselves up on a course for death. The Bible tells us clearly that the wages, the cost of sin, is death. That's the punishment. It doesn't matter what the sin is. Any sin, all sin. One punishment, one offense. Sin equals death, and we know that. The Bible tells us this. And because of God's great, great love for us, he did something that we could never do for ourselves. God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And he gave up his own life for us. He took that punishment for all of the sins so that we could live. Now, I don't care who you are or where you come from, that is pretty extreme. As far as an expression of love, I mean, the Bible does tell us that greater love has no one than this, than they give up their lives for their friends. Jesus did it for all of us. 
Jesus gave up his life for people that hate him. Right? Romans 5, 6, and 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a righteous or for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Didn't wait for us to get anything, get our acting gear. Didn't wait for us to show up to church. He didn't wait for any of that stuff to happen. While we were still offending God, while we were still doing the things that equaled death, Jesus died for us. There are so many reasons why we should give love God with all of our soul, and these are just a few of the good ones, a few of the ones I like. Also not to mention that we're commanded to. It's pretty big, right? We're commanded to love God with all of our soul. But the real question is, how do we do it? Right? How do we go about this, this loving God with all of our soul thing that we're talking about? I mean, Jesus commanded it, so it's obvious we need to do it. We need to be loving Him with all that we are, the whole person, right to the core as a response to Him having our whole heart. But what does it look like? How do we love Him with all of our soul? Well, first off, I would suggest this, that we need to put God first in our lives. Now, now I know that when I say that, there's like a little light that goes off in most people's brains. They're like, he says this all the time, right? Like, and it's true. I do. If that's what you're thinking, you're 100% right. I say this one all the time. I bring it up in probably 90% of the messages that I preach. But it is not because of a theology I'm trying to get you to take on. It's because this is just common sense. And the truth of it is, whatever is most precious to us will always have first place. Whatever it is that we have made number one in our hearts is always going to have the first priority. And if it isn't God, it's working against God. Does that make sense to you? Because it's really that simple. Uh, professor uh, Robert Coleman. So this is, uh, he is a senior professor of discipleship and evangelism at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. That's a mouthful. He's a former professor of Asbury Theological Seminary, and he once said this. He said, true worship can only take place when we agree to God sitting not only on his throne at the center of the universe, but on the throne that stands at the center of our hearts. Now, I don't know about you, but when I, when I read that, when that hit my mind, and, and more importantly, hit my heart, I could see that. And I started asking myself the question, do I have God seated on a throne in the universe at the center of all things? Or do I have him seated on a throne that's at the center of me? Putting God first means that you form your values on the Word of God. It means that the decisions you make in this life reflect His priorities. It means that your schedule allows time uh, spent speaking with him, reading his word, taking part in his body, the church. It means that above everything else, we want to know him more and more every day. The worship artist Matt Redman said this. He said, in the end, worship can never be a performance, something that you're pretending or putting on. It's got to be an overflow of your heart. We talked a bit about that last week. Worship is about getting personal with God, drawing close to God when passion becomes action. Another way to love God with all our souls is we need to do things that make God happy. And before anybody goes, well, that's a little weird. Because <laughs> when I wrote it, I went, that's a little weird, right? But before you think that sounds funny, I want to point out that this one is really just common sense. If you love somebody, think about it. If you love somebody, if you actually adore somebody, you're not going to just go through life trying not to hurt them. Right? That sounds silly when I say it like that. If you love somebody, you don't just go through life trying not to hurt them. On the contrary, if you love somebody, you're going to do things that you know pleases them. Does that make sense? 
I mean, think about all the relationships in your life. If you love somebody deeply, you don't just like walk around just just trying not to hurt them. You do things that they enjoy. You do things that they like. And no, honey, you pick where we go tonight because, you know, eventually we can decide. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) If you love somebody, you're going to do the things that please them, the things that make them happy in this is not out of a sense of obligation. I don't do things like that with Tracy because I'm obliged to her. I mean, I am, but that isn't why I do those things. I do those things because I want her heart to be pleased. I want my wife to be uplifted, to be happy, to have joy. I want to experience that with her. I love the look of of my wife's face when it's all pulled up in a smile and glowing. I love that. It makes me feel so good when I see that in her. So, it isn't out of obligation. It's out of a love for the person that we love, that we do these things. So, years ago, and I I mean a long time ago, uh, long before Rachel was even born, when we still used to live in New Brunswick, uh, back when Crystal and Jamie were still diaper-wearing balls of energy and noise, we, uh, every year, at least twice a year, we would drive from Sussex, New Brunswick, to Kingston, Ontario, to spend a week with Tracy's parents, right? And it was a lot. It was huge. I mean, the most important thing was that our kids were really little, and a 15-hour drive for little ones is not cool, so we did it at night. We would leave just before supper. We'd stop at McDonald's, get them a bunch of stuff, garbage they could put in their face, and then we would start driving, and they would fall asleep, and they would sleep all night in the backseat of the car, right? Seem, seems like a smart thing to do. However, I was in university full-time at the time, And I had just done an entire day of classes and I'd already been awake for 11 hours when I climbed into the car to start a 15-hour drive. So by the time I arrived at Kingston, every single time, I was a zombie. I was so tired. I was like, and for about three days, every time we made that trip, for about three days, I was no good for anything. I was trying to flip my my sleep over because I came in and immediately went to bed for like 24 hours, but then I'm awake at night and asleep during the day. It was all, it was all messed up. And so it took me about three days to get my hours shifted back around so I could actually be around everybody. And then, and then a couple of days later, we would turn around and do it again, <laughs> go all the way back. So, so here's the thing. I, I love my in-laws. I have the best in-laws on the planet. Love them dearly. I love spending time with them. I loved going to Kingston. I loved being there. But that trip sucked every time. It was awful. I hated it. I could not stand it. I did it because it was really important to the person that I love more than any other human being on this planet. I did it because I love her and I want her to be happy. Not because of any obligation I might have to her. And I did it a lot. We need to be doing things that make God happy. And if we don't know what that is, then we need to get to know Him a little bit more so that we do know what pleases Him. He gave us everything we need in His Word. Everything we need is right there in the Bible. It should be a daily habit that each and every one of us get alone with Him and His Word to learn more about who He is and what the desire of His heart is so that we can please Him. And if we know him really, really, really well, and we think we have all the answers, we should also know that there's still more that he has for us, and we should dive right back in again. The last way that we love God with all of our souls that I'm going to talk about today, that is, is that we need to tell tell others about this great love that we have in God. Did I put that the right way? Yeah. This is another one of those things that sounds like something your pastor says because you're supposed to do church stuff. But again, this isn't just something you're supposed to do because you're a disciple of Jesus. This is actually one of those things that makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, if you love somebody, if you actually adore someone, people hear about it, right? Come on. Do they? I mean, I'm not just making this stuff up, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's the way it is. Think about when you met that special someone. Huh? At the very least, even if you're a quiet person, 
Even if your personality is quiet or very introverted, you don't talk to a lot of people, when you meet somebody that special, your family's going to hear about it, right? Your closest friends, maybe even your neighbors. I mean, you're not going to tell maybe the cashier at Walmart because you, you don't have much of a relationship with that person. But the people that are close to you, the people that you know, you're going to tell them about this special person. Why? Because we're excited, right? I think back when I first met Tracy, well, about a month later when we started dating, and I was out of my mind. I told everybody. I told the cashier at Walmart because I'll talk to anybody because I like humans, yeah? But that's, that's what we do. We get excited. We're just like, hey, man, I met somebody. And they're like, oh, really? And people want to hear about it. Do we tell people about the one that we say we love? The one who should have first place in our lives? The one who should be captivated in our own hearts? I confess I haven't always done that. I mean, I've done it a lot, but I haven't always done it. And sometimes this world pushes back on that kind of thing, right? Sometimes this world, the culture that we live in, wants to push back against you sharing the name of Jesus Christ with anybody. They'll tell you all kinds of things just to stop you. But I think back to when I first met Tracy. Ain't nobody could get me to shut up about her. Nobody. I was crazy about her. Still am. (laughs) You know Tracy, right? She's over there. Yeah. (laughs) You should be telling people about Jesus. I mean, if you love somebody, people are hearing about it. It just makes sense. And it's also a command. Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is something that we're actually commanded to do. And just to be clear, just because we're commanded to do something doesn't mean that suddenly we're, it's, it's, it's an obligation. I mean, it is. But that's not why we do it. We do it because we love Him. Even Jesus Himself told us to obey His commands because we love Him. One of the things we were just talking about on, on Monday past at our small group was John 14 and 15 where Jesus said specifically, if you love me, obey my commands. Right? It's not, if you're afraid of me, do what I say. Right? It, it, it's not if you're obliged to me, so do this thing. He said, if you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you'll do what I ask. Yeah? Yeah? If you love Jesus, don't keep it a secret. Tell people about him. I mean, you talk to people about the ones you love. Tracy comes up in conversation with people that I have all the time. She even shows up in sermons every once in a while. The point is, is that you can't help but talk about the people that you love. And I know you love them. So why do we, why do we stop ourselves from talking about them? Let it out. Tell the people you know. Tell your neighbors. Tell your friends. Not everybody's going to want to hear about it. That's okay. Move on. Lots of people out there. Tell the cashier at Walmart. I dare you. (laughs) (laughs) Hebrews 13 and 15 says, With Jesus' help, let us continually offer our sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming the glory of His name. It's powerful, isn't it? Our sacrifice of praise, proclaiming the glory of His name. One day, every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess, no exceptions, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we will all be there to see it. Why not tell everybody you know now, so they can be with us when that happens. Yeah?